welcome back to our course in construction grammar. Today we will look at the various ways in which constructions can be represented. Just a quick revision. Last session I introduced to you construction grammar as a cognitive theory of language. The central idea and the central unit of this approach is already in the name. So the central basic unit are constructions, pairings of form and meaning. And today we're going to look more closely at the notational variants of how different approaches formalize or try to represent these form meaning pairings. This is important because in the literature you might come across a multitude of variants and it's important to understand and remember that they're all doing the same thing. So this session should enable you to read these various representations. In addition to that, we will also take a closer look at schematization, how constructions can become productive. Back to our introductory example. Take the word apple. It is clearly a construction. It has got form, apple, as well as meaning. So this form is linked to a mental concept of an apple, which includes rich encyclopedic knowledge what an apple looks like, where you find them, what they taste like, and so on. The relationship between the two is a symbolic link. Now another thing that's a bit hidden in this notation is the fact that apple is a noun. We see this on the form level in the little subscript n. This has important consequences because, well, from a conceptual point of view, we treat it as a thing, as a holistic entity, and on the syntactic level, it means that we're going to use it in places where nouns can go. The apple, two apples, and so on. Now this is one way of representing a construction. And this is modelled on the box notation used by Croft and Cruz in their Introduction to Cognitive Linguistics. What you can also do is, you can sort of see form as a label and apple as the instantiation of that. In the same sense, as you would fill in a form with your name. Let me show you what I mean. This is the so-called attribute value matrix alternative, which you're also going to come across in several constructionist publications. So the idea is that you've got an attribute like first name, last name, gender and occupation, and for each specific instance, for each person, you would fill it in. So you would fill in your name and your gender and your occupation, and for me, the value of the attribute first name is Thomas. The value of the attribute last name is Hoffman. The value of the attribute gender is male, and so on. In this sense, you can also treat constructions as attribute value matrices. So form is something like first name, and the attribute is apple in this case or meaning is like a last name, and the instantiation is apple, the property of being an apple. Now once you take this a step further, as you can see on the right, you can split up the information on the form level into subcategories. Attributes can also have other attributes as their values. So say under name, you've got the attributes first name, last name, and title. And these would then again have a value. In my case, Thomas Hoffman and maybe Professor. The notation on the right that you see here does the same thing for a construction. So the form level now has attributes, phonology and syntax. And these are again attributes that have to be filled by a value. So instead of putting syntactic information together with phonological information into a single element, as you can see in the box on the left, where the noun category is only a subscript, on the right we've just split this up. So now phonology is a known attribute and syntax is a known attribute, which here is filled by the value that it's still the category noun. Meaning in this notation um, still only has a single value, but we will see that some approaches develop even more complicated AVMs, attribute value matrices. Now very often you will see an even simpler notation. So in light blue you see a simplified notation of this. 
you've got the attribute form, which has apple and indicates that it's a noun. To the left of a double arrow and to the right of it, you've got the meaning, which is just represented as apple. This is a simplified notation that you will find in many publications. The main point of this slide is just to show you all of these representations have form and meaning. And at the end of the day, there's just different ways of formalizing, of putting down, of representing the same thing. Let's take a closer look at more productive constructions and how they are represented. Remember unfriendly, unacceptable, unfaithful. Now, the main general human property is the fact that we can detect patterns. Clearly, you've already identified the pattern here. And this allows us then to generalize. So here we know that something starts with un, is followed by an adjective, friendly, acceptable, and faithful, and the resulting word, unfriendly, unacceptable, unfaithful, always means not the property that the adjective has. So unfriendly means not friendly, unacceptable, not acceptable, unfaithful, not faithful. So how can we put this into a constructional schema? In our simplified version, we again have form as an attribute, and the value is un, string of sounds, followed by an adjective slot. This is linked to the meaning of not adjective, and the two are put together by a double arrow. This straightforwardly corresponds to the box notation that we already know. It's just that in the simplified version, you've got it reading from left to right in a single line, and in the box notation, what you get is a vertical representation of form and meaning. Also, I've added a little bit um, on the meaning level in the box notation, because adjective is obviously not the meaning um, of this construction, but an adjective stands for a property. So free means the property of being free. Um, happy means the property of being happy. Now in another AVM representation, we can again just split up phonology and syntax and treat these as values to the attribute of form. But at the end of the day, this is saying the same thing. On the phonological level, you've got un, which is fixed, then an open slot. On the syntactic level, the whole thing has the category of an adjective because unhappy, untrue, unfriendly can be used like any other adjective in English. Um, an unhappy man, the man was unhappy. A happy man, the man was happy. So it appears in the same syntactic context. The meaning is of course not X, so not happy, not free and so on. As I said, the idea here is just to show you that constructions always form a meaning. And that one important difference between approaches is just how they encode this. And this can become really complicated. Let's look at another construction, undo, unlock, untie, which looks similar to unhappy, unfriendly, unfaithful, but of course is a completely different construction. Because this doesn't mean not do, not lock, not tie. No, it means something like reverse the action. So reverse the doing, reverse the locking, reverse the tying. A simplified version of this is thus that we have an un followed by a verb slot and the meaning is reverse this verbal action. This is an actual AVM from a publication by Ivan Sark. Um, the approach um, that he uses is called sign-based construction grammar. Later in the course, I will give you an overview of the different approaches and their different notational systems. For now, it's just important for you not to be intimidated by the graph, okay? It looks really complicated, and it is, but at the same time, you can straightforwardly analyze this, okay? It's a construction grammar approach. So what does that mean? It must encode form and meaning. Okay, if you look at the two blue boxes, what you can see here is that there is a form and a sem. So form and semantics are already in there. There's also MTR, that stands for mother, and DTRS, which stands for daughters. What this corresponds to is the fact that this construction contains two subconstructions. On the mother level, we can also call this the output, we've got the unverb construction. And that's a transitive verb, that's what the trans stands for. And then in the input, we've got a simple transitive verb. 
So this just links your verbs like do, lock and tie to the undo, unlock, untie by putting them into a single schema. Okay, so the unverb construction, as you can see on the left hand side of the graph, that flashes out into a more complex construction that has an input, the transitive verb, that ends up as an untransitive verb, and then has a corresponding meaning. But again, the important point is, despite all the nitty gritty details, it's got form, it's got meaning, it's a construction. So takeaway message is don't get intimidated by these representations. If it's got form and meaning, it's a construction. And if you keep this in mind, then reading these highly formalized papers should also not be a problem. But as I said, we'll get back to these formalizations at the end of the course when we compare the different approaches. Summing up. Constructions are form and meaning pairs. There are different notational variants and some of them look really complicated but at the heart of them, they've always got the same underlying assumption. Moreover, we see that form isn't just phonological information. Because of pattern detection skills, we can generalize. We can have slots as in untrue, unfriendly, unhappy, so unadjective, undo, untie, unlock, unverb. We see these patterns and we create slots which give us so-called schematic constructions, which allow us to be productive. Last time, we saw an example of the unguchi construction. So the kid used the unadjective construction to create a new item. How this exactly works, we will flesh out in the session on usage-based construction grammar. Okay, thanks again for your attention. See you next time.